Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Africans Arise. Uh, my name is Eli Wananda, and if you haven't already subscribed to this channel, make sure that you do so, please. So, what is Africans Arise first and foremost? Africans Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Africans Arise. I always do that. Africans Arise is an online project or portal which is focused on the question of how can African people unite and liberate ourselves? My aim with this channel is to bring together brothers and sisters, elders and young'uns from across the African diaspora and also from across the African continent to learn, to share experiences with one another, to learn from one, one another and to inspire one another, I guess, to come up with, uh, come up with strategies and plans and projects as to how we can play our part in liberating ourselves and unifying ourselves as black people, as African people worldwide. In today's live stream, we are very, or I am very blessed and uh, honored to be joined by a brother from Brazil, who I've recently found out about following my live stream that I did with Nsang Cristia Esimi on the Spanish speaking uh, diaspora, African diaspora. Uh, so, without further ado, let me, let me not waste any more time and introduce my brother here, uh, Humberto Baltar. Greetings to you. There we go. Sorry, I'm, your mic was muted. So, let's do that again. <laughs> okay, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm really delighted to be here, Ali, to uh, talk with you about this. Uh, issue of racism that is so important and uh, so sad on the same time and uh, so widespread yeah this global uh, problem we all face but i think it is essential to to discuss it to talk about it so i feel really um glad for this opportunity to share a little bit about our experience here uh, in brazil thank you so much for having me Wonderful, wonderful. It's a pleasure. And um, I guess it's quite warm. This is this is summertime where you are, right? In Rio? Summertime, yeah. We have 37 or 38 degrees here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. It's pretty hot today. That's why I'm wearing a sleeveless shirt because there is no other <laughs> possible <laughs> clothing for now. Uh, yeah. Sorry for, for being so informal, so casual. <laughs> That's beautiful, man. You you know what, you're, the weather you guys have got in Brazil is more like the weather in Africa, of course. So, you know, you're you're kind of like in your natural, more of your natural environment, you could say. So <laughs> here, here in the UK, we're probably like four or five degrees, possibly Celsius. Wow. So it's freezing. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but we give thanks, you know, we give thanks. We're alive and well, even if it's freezing cold here in the Northern Hemisphere. So, Humberto, first of all, am I pronouncing your name right? It's H Humberto, yeah? Or is, do we drop the H or say the H? Yeah, the H does not have an R sound, so it's like Humberto, yeah? Um, Humberto, okay, good, good, good. Exactly. Humberto, good, good, good. All right, thank you. So, first of all, I thought we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot today um, about various different things to do with Brazil. Uh, raising, obviously, the title of our discussion is up here is raising black children in racist Brazil. So we're gonna talk about raising children. Uh, we're gonna talk about Brazil being racist. Uh, and but first of all, I wanted to start off by um, if we could just. Tell, if you could just tell us, uh, first of all, a little bit about yourself, just your, your background, uh, where in Brazil you live, um, what you do and so forth. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be good just for just for our, our viewers to know. And I want to just also send a shout out to all of the early early joiners to the live screen. Shout out to Culture 88. Hi from okay. Chicago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> shout out to uh, Gla 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 you can help me out with you. Oh, yeah, Glauco, Glauco Figueiredo, my brother. <laughs> uh, all right, shout out to you, my friend. Welcome. <laughs> Mind the matter, shout outs to you. Um, and uh, yeah, Glacau Gla Gla says hi from Presidente Prudente, Sao Paulo. Yeah. Okay. All right, Sao Paulo. Great. Sao Paulo in the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so sorry, yeah, Umberto, yeah. Tell us, tell us all about yourself, if you could. Yeah, I was raised here in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil, and uh, in a poor neighborhood. Uh, my mother was a maid, a domestic worker, and I was raised uh, in her job. So it was a, 
uh, where she used to work. So it was uh, a very um, limited um, childhood where I didn't have, you know, like uh, luxury or of any kind. So this privacy, this uh, very uh, uh, limited life since uh, childhood is a, a reflex of the, the racial scenario here in Brazil. Most Blacks usually live in those conditions. So those conditions, they have an impact in what we sometimes dream of doing or even if we might dream or not, because most of us don't even have ambitions or aspirations because of such uh, 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 poverty uh, conditions and, and so on. But I, I always wanted to be a teacher. I, I, I loved English since I was uh, a kid. So because I liked rock maybe, and then I became a, an English teacher later. Okay. And uh, I used to work uh, in public schools in the beginning, then uh, teaching uh, online and then in companies. And now I came back to online teaching. I have students everywhere in mo most countries. And uh, besides that, um, we, I have a collective, like a group of black parents online, and we share experiences uh, about how to raise our kids, how to deal with uh, family issues, exactly because when I got to know that I was going to be a father, I looked for other fathers, other black parents uh, to talk to me, to share experiences. And then with this, uh, our group was born, Black Fathers, yeah, in Portuguese, Pais Pretos. And then the, the, the meaning became wider because it became Black parents, because we have mothers as well in our groups nowadays. And every day we are learning uh, together. It is a very uh, rich uh, environment nowadays online, but used to be face to face. We used to gather together uh, to discuss our issues because here in Brazil, we have a lack of information of our black ancestry. Nobody talks about our African history. People don't even know what it means, uh, Pan-Africanism, for example, nobody knows it. Uh, the regular black has no idea about who Garvey was, for example. They don't even know. They don't even know how to name free capitals in the African continent. So Brazilian uh, society is so racist. Sy systemic racism is so strong here that even our schools doesn't talk about our black heritage. They give no information about our black ancestry. Uh, we see white Egyptians in our school books. It is like a joke, you, you know, it's unbelievable. We see a white Africa. So it's really uh, um, sad, the scenario. That's why I decided to start a group of black fathers, black mothers and discuss our issues because we have a, a really limited conditions, very poor conditions uh regarding african knowledge and then because there are so much material so so many resources uh, in english mm. i decided to look for the for those materials and translate uh, everything i can to our brothers and sisters for our discussions and that's why i felt so happy to be here with you because then i can share uh, everything again uh, with ben we are going to talk about this conversation also and others, yeah, because we need to promote those discussions because if we depend on our society, our teachers, our schools, the churches, what to speak of churches who demonize the African continent, we have no, no information at all. So everything we do, everything we learn, everything we get is by ourselves. There is no other way in Brazil, unfortunately. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so much in there. So much in there to to start with. So, so Pais Pretos Presentes. That, yeah. I, what is it? What's the English translation for that? I know Pretos is black, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Pais Pretos Presentes means present black fathers. Yeah. This would be the, the, the actual uh, translation. Present because... Um, most people, they say they love us, we are all a family, Blacks together, Umoja, and all that. 
But when you really meet those people, they're not around. So I felt that presence needed to be in the name of our, our group because people need to know that they can count on us, especially our Black women, because there is a, a, a culture of abandoning, leaving behind uh, Black women, especially, specifically. And Black men usually have this tendency of looking for white women and uh, disregarding our uh, sisters. So I, since the beginning of our group, I really felt that presence, the word presence needed to be somehow in the name of our initiative because presence is something which is lacking uh, in our society. Black people lead the worst numbers in terms of loneliness. We are leaders in Brazil in suicides. We are leaders in Brazil in um, mental institutions. Uh, black population is the one which is mostly there. We are leaders of homeless. Yeah, homelessness is, is sky high among black population. And therefore, I really felt that uh, presence needs to be some uh, a strong value among us. So nowadays, no matter the time, no matter the day, if somebody looks for help in one of our groups, be it Telegram, uh, WhatsApp, Facebook, they will find somebody there who can share some words of encouragement, some, some words of uh, love, some words of knowledge sometimes because we don't have much information. So sometimes people want to know who Garvey was and then they need to, to see somebody who can share uh, information about those uh, black activists, Nadov, Klenora Hudson. People don't know about uh, womanism, Africana, for example. Many people don't know about it in Brazil. So black men try to uh, find a better version of themselves in white feminism or black feminism. But feminism is something from Europe, from Europeans. So how can it emancipate black people? It comes from white uh, values and principles. So we really need to spread the words about what Africa has to share. Mm. Wonderful. And for for just tick, dripping along along the bottom of the screen there is how you can get in touch with them. Um, exactly. Yeah, myurls.co, Black Parents. Perfect. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. Now, so what I wanted to do, you're you're it's, you're brilliant because you're 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 basically summarizing everything in every comment that you make. You're bringing so many things in. It's like, yeah, good, all right, brilliant. Um, what I'd like to do, um, first of all, if 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 you if you don't mind, is people. Some people are going to not are, are not going to be uh, or are going to be surprised to hear racist Brazil. Okay. Yeah. Some people are going to think, what? Because let me tell you something, particularly here in the United Kingdom, and I think it's the same enough in most of the uh, Anglophile world, and probably the whole of the world outside Brazil, actually. The image of Brazil is is idyllic, if you, if you know what that means. It's, it's like, oh, Brazil is this wonderful place where look how everyone is intermingling the blacks you know the african the black people love the whites the whites love the blacks there's no there's this idea that oh brazil is not like that horrible united states you know oh no they're they're killing people it's the, you know black lives matter. no no that's america you know but brazil is a wonderful racial haven you know so it, let's let's break down if you if you don't mind why do we say race uh, brazil is racist what's What's the evidence for that? I mean, you've said some of it already, but if you wouldn't mind expanding on some of that, please. Yeah, this question is great, exactly because we didn't have the same model of society we had, for example, in Africa and the United States, in which we had so, uh, racial segregation. So places where black people could, would, were not allowed to access, like schools and clubs, and even on the bus, there was a specific site for white people and one for black people. We did not have this in Brazil. And that's why many people believe we do not have racism around here, because black people were never uh, explicitly segregated from any place. And then people have this uh, racial democracy idea that all races are welcome, everybody join hands together and sing Kumbaya and we are all happy and so on. But this is not true at all. <laughs> this is a very hypocrite image. Our government sells uh, to tourists 
but actually black people do not have access to most places in Brazil, even restaurants, even schools. We have most uh, private schools. If you look for them, you have just white students. Uh, black kids usually don't have access to private schools in Brazil because they're really expensive and the black population is really poor because this is a heritage. Come on, Apollo. Apollo wants to type the keywords. That's okay, good. so uh, what, what I was saying is that uh, the condition of black societies in Brazil is uh, a consequence of slavery of black people, which took a long time in Brazil and was over just a few years ago. People say that there is a very uh, nice comparison that if our history was a two hour movie, uh, black slavery would end in like one minute and 44. This is our, our reality. So black slavery ended two or three generations ago. So black population doesn't have access to the most basic things, home, education, health, uh, you know, uh, even information, basic information about history because in systemic racism, everything which connects to black history is uh, denied to us. We really don't have information about. I got to know what I know nowadays about black history because I looked for it. I, I did my research, I did my homework, and then I got to know about womanism, Africana, I got to know about Garvey, I got to know about Afrocentricity, I got to know about Pan-Africanism, but nobody at school or even college, I took five years college, I have never read a black writer at college, especially from Af Africa. No, no offer uh, from Africa is quoted in Brazilian universities. It's, it's a joke because I say this, it's a joke because we are the biggest black population outside African continent. We only lose to Nigeria. So yes. how come black Brazilians have no idea about their heritage, their culture, uh, uh, their ancestry? I, for example, my name uh, is Humberto Baltar da Silva. So Silva, the, the, the name Silva is from Europe. So I, I carry the name of my colonizers. I don't even know which ethnicity I come from in Africa. So I'm supposed to take a test, which is, I don't know, $200 to mm -hmm. get to know the percentage of uh, uh, where I belong in Africa. So this is the situation of the black person in Brazil. We have no idea where exactly we are from. So the, the, the mm -hmm. average black Brazilian wants to get the closer possible to the white people so that they can feel that they have succeeded in life. So what you're gonna see usually is the successful uh, black man marrying a white woman, blue eyes or green eyes mostly, so that he can feel that he has succeeded in life. And this is not for him to blame. It's because since we are kids, we are thrown uh, at uh, Disney cartoons where we only see blonde princesses and white princesses, blue-eyed princesses. So every black person is taught to desire to look white. Sometimes they even deny their physical characteristics. We have a, a famous case here in our country of a singer who has done a plastic surgery to make her nose look thinner. My goodness, this is crazy. What's, People, what, what's the name of this uh, singer? Oh, her name is, um, let me remember her name. Oh, it's... Um, sorry, I'm sorry to put her on the spot like that. Oh, but she's famous, Ludmilla. Ludmilla, I, I remember. Okay. So she made her nose look thinner so that she could, you know, sell more, so that she could be more popular, more famous. And this is a, a shame. This is really sad. We have to deny our own characteristics to be famous, to have money, to have... Uh, access uh, in society. So uh, our our condition is really sad in Brazil, I would say. There is no <laughs> better word for this. It's really sad because we have to look for our origins by ourselves because we cannot rely on the states. We cannot rely 
on our schools. We cannot rely nowhere. It's crazy. Yeah. So we need to count on groups, internet groups or, or groups of black activists. So that's what the black person has to count on in Brazilian society. I love your emphasis on action. It's such a it's such a it's such a great thing to hear because you're constantly not just focusing on the all right. Well, this is you know this is the racism and this is what uh, white supremacy is doing. But you're also you keep bringing it back to this is why we have to act for self, do for self. And um, are you quite influenced by Garvey then, Marcus Garvey? Because you, you brought Marcus Garvey up a couple of times, and he obviously one of his big things was race first, and you know. Um, we must rise ourselves up. Africans arise is, you know, comes from that, comes from that yeah. here as well. So Garvey, Garvey appears to be somewhat of a, of, a, of a keen influence on you. Yeah, yeah, because here in Brazil, we have this uh, belief, I think it comes from Christianity's culture. We have this belief that a, mess, a Messiah will come to save us. We, we, we were always waiting for somebody to put us, I, I mean, we, uh, black community, we are always waiting for someone, a uh, governor maybe, a mayor, a president maybe, and then we don't do things for ourselves. And this is really sad, I think. So this is a, 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 a premise in our group. So we try to be self-sufficient, self-sustainable, and also economically. And uh, last year was really interesting because we did, we did a lot of work in our uh, Pais Pretos Presentes group in uh, providing consultancy, uh, racial consultancy to companies, schools, organizations. And then uh, this raised money for us to maintain, to keep ourselves and even help families uh, who are socially vulnerable, who cannot pay their bills, who need food, who need uh, uh, some kind of... Uh, help and this was amazing for us because Facebook, for example, uh, promoted our group in different um, marketing campaigns, and this was very profitable to us. And that's why I, I emphasize this this uh, teachings of Garvey because if we keep waiting for a savior, and usually we expect this savior to be white, we're gonna be you know left behind so we really need to look and, and try ourselves to do uh what we can of course we we have nothing uh big nothing much we don't have anybody with a lot of money a lot of fame or nothing like that but because of our history i believe that uh what really works is a a, a sum of small efforts i don't believe anymore in somebody big let's look for a famous black who knows a lot of people, who is a big name in Brazil, because I have tried that. And I saw that those people, they're only uh, worried about fame, about making a name. And this is also a consequence of a white mentality. Me first, me, myself, and I first. So there is no vision of community. That's why I put uh, Habari Gani, Umoja, in our banner, because I think Umoja is the principle, uh, the main principle for us as a, as a Black uh, community. We need to know that all Blacks are a family. We are together. We need to have this mentality, this mindset. I think it's essential. So here in our Pais uh, Pretos link, you can have, uh, you can see the join us. So we invite people from all the world to join us. We ask okay. for a few information like first name, last name, uh, city, just for us to know briefly who is everybody who is coming uh, along. Then we have our Facebook, our, our YouTube with uh, a link with lots of videos, interviews, yeah. and, and everything we have done. Next, we have the Facebook with many families. We have now 22,000 members. So it's a great number oh. of people who, who want to share and learn from each other. So we are growing a lot. And I'm really happy to be part of this Facebook group. Our Instagram is really important because it's not just about pictures. It's about representativeness. Here in Brazil, in the, our movie, so popular series, they usually portray white family, uh, black families as a failure. The, the, the black father is usually a, a drunk guy, absent, 
somebody who is rude, aggressive to the kids and their uh, family. And then we try to show that it's not like that. We have lots of black families which are happy, which are delighted. We have all kinds of configuration of families as well. We have uh, uh, homosexual families, we have uh, polygamic families, we have different kinds of families. And we need to show this variety to people so that they can appreciate our uh, how rich we are. I think we need to stimulate this kind of visibility because if we depend on the media, nothing will be done. And then uh, I guess uh, there is a, uh, we have a telegram group as well, but it's just 30. We study African ancestry there. We have studied many books so far there. I remember uh, we studied a very interesting um, text by Bell Hooks, uh, mm -hmm. Living Out of Love. It was really, really, really important for us to study that book because most Blacks in Brazil, we ha they have a difficulty to show their love, to demonstrate their love, and they don't know why. And in this text, she shows how being enslaved is um, bad to us. I mean, in our capacity of demonstrating our, our feelings, of expressing our freedom, most of us, even nowadays in 2020, we don't feel like we are free because there is something called uh, uh, ancestry memory. So yeah. we, can, we, we, we still see reality as if we were enslaved because society behaves as if we are. So people treat us like slaves. So most of us are still in this uh, mentality that we cannot be 100% free to love, to have fun, to express ourselves. So it's really necessary to have a channel where people can see Black families enjoying, having fun, having a great time, celebrating. So it's really important uh, to have this Instagram account to show um, all the variety in Black families in Brazil, especially the Black families who are studying their history, their, their culture, their ancestry, uh, Pan-Africanism, and so on. It's really essential to spread the words among our followers. Wonderful stuff. So, yeah, I just want to send a shout out to some of our viewers. So, greetings to Zandi Radebi. I didn't, we got a viewer from Azania, South Africa. Shout out. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Jerina Starr, who... who Jerina Starr is the one who told me about your group. Um, oh, she's amazing. Yeah, she's saying uh, excellent name for your group. Uh, we've got shout out to Marcus Vis Vinicius, who says this Brazilian image is a big fantasy, which you've just explained. Exactly. Shout out, yeah, shout out to James Goodwin, very bright young man. There always comes up with some very interesting, very thought provoking comments in our stream. So big ups. Uh, and Shout out to Tessie Silva as well. Um, says, well done. Yeah. Uh, and like um, Jarena Star says here, hit the thumbs up button. <laughs> Make sure you hit the thumbs up, yeah, because that helps with uh, promoting the uh, the video to people's feeds and so forth. So 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 thank you for that, Jarena. Now, uh, Umberto, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that I've been looking at um, you know, doing a bit of research into Brazil and this, so the, the, the population of Brazil, how many black people are there in Brazil? Oh, we have, uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's 54% of the population. So we are the majority in Brazil. Yeah, we have uh, black people and there is, there is something that we call uh, pardos, which would be something like uh, mixed race, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, mixed race people and black people together, they compose our black population. So it's 54% of the population. So it's a lot of people. We are the majority, but we don't act like majority because we don't have a, a sense of units. We don't know we are one. We don't have this belief. We don't even want to be one. We don't want to look African. And this is the problem because we, we don't feel 
we don't feel united. No, yeah. no, no. The reason I asked that question though was because I've I've seen some statistics or some 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 census figures from um, 2011 or 2010, I think it was, and it, I saw some figures that said that the the percentage of people who class themselves as just black was really really small. It was like, yeah, six percent or something. Yeah. And then, but then, like I know, there's this uh, the African descended population, you know, which which is the bigger group. Um, so, is it the case that people who look like you, you know, like you or me or whatever, are actually only about five or six percent, and then the other fifty percent is are mixed looking people, people who look like I don't know. Um, Neymar, Ronaldo, you know, footballers are the, the place to go. Yeah, that's it. People who look like Shakira, for example, they don't feel they're black. They say they're morena, mulatto, mixed race. They have lots of names for that. Uh, mm. Dark skin sometimes or light skin, whatever. Mm. But people who are really, really black, like the colors we have here in our screen, then they, they, they are like 6% that they claim to be um Blacks and uh, but this is changing. Uh, yeah. We have more and more people uh, declaring to be black, fortunately, but still a lot of people deny their ancestry because they don't they really don't want to look black, and this is the the problem. Systemic racism really worked in Brazil and really actually works still. People want to look the whiter possible. And there is a very interesting phenomenon, for example, mm. we see many Blacks at the church and we see many white people celebrating uh, African uh, religions, yeah, Afro-Brazilian religions, like Candomblé, exactly. Yeah. And it's crazy. It's crazy because uh, mm. most Blacks, they don't want to look African at all. So they reject everything which resembles Africa mm. and they look for things that look the whiter possible. So you will find uh, black Catholics, uh, black Protestants, black whatever, but in African religions, they tend to reject. Yeah, so this is a phenomenon mm. caused by systemic racism. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so the, there's a couple of comments here which uh, which are useful. So um, Blauco says that the black and mixed population in Brazil represents almost 110 million people, which is a staggering amount of people. Uh, okay. Um, and then so we're saying that the the, the number of those who are uh, not mixed would be maybe. What a lot lower, 10, 20 million or something. I don't know, but yeah, many people, <laughs> which is still huge. Yeah. So, what, um, uh, why do you think people are more recently becoming more comfortable with claiming themselves as being black, being African? Yeah. Uh, cases like George Floyd, for instance, made, mm. uh, made people see that we cannot die like rats, you know, we cannot. Being keep being killed like that, like cockroaches or insects or anything like that. And every week in Rio de Janeiro, my city, a black kid is killed in a community by the police or in a in a shooting with police and, and criminals. This happens yeah. weekly here. We have uh, uh, three kids that have gone missing, for example, and there is no serious investigation about it. People have no idea about happen what happened to those kids. Mm -hmm. And if they were white, we would see a completely different scenario. We would see helicopters, uh, TV, campaigns, and everything being done mm -hmm. to fight those kids. So we see a completely unequal treatment when it comes to uh, racial difference. Yeah, so it's really, really tragic, the scenario in Brazil. Yeah, and I've heard you say that a black man is killed every 23 minutes in, in, in Brazil or something yeah, like that. Yeah, this is, this is according to the United Nations, but if we, if we dig into the number, will be even worse than that. Right, that's, that's incredible. And one, one case that I, I, I was reading about, I heard about last November was, was particularly striking. Is it Joao Freitas? Joao Freitas? 
um, the the guy who was shot dead, who was shot dead by security guards or beaten to death by security guards in uh, was it um, Curitiba or somewhere like that in the south of in the yeah. south of the country. And um, what I found particularly uh, poignant about that killing was that it was he was killed on the day before um, uh, the the day of was it African African History Day or whatever it is in Brazil, which which commemorates the day when yeah Zuma yeah yeah was, November twenty was was killed. So that was that was a I think I awareness yeah yeah. So I think a lot I don't think a lot of people outside of Brazil realize that those dynamics exist the the, the violence the the the, the the state violence against black people. And maybe, could you talk a little bit uh, in particular about the favela situation, the situation in the favelas? And the, from what I can gather, there's basically a state of nonstop war between the populations in the favelas, which are, which are massively black as well, but also include other people, and the police and the army and, and, and so forth. How, can you help us to understand what's going on in the favelas with regard to um, yeah, first first of all, we need to go to the slavery to understand this because favelas used to be just hills in the past. Nobody would use to live there. Yeah. But when the slavery was abolished, uh, those black people didn't have a home. They didn't have anywhere to go. So that's where they went to live. They went to those hills. And then there was a law. Uh, that if you were caught on the streets without a home, you would go to jail. And most Blacks uh, went to prison because of that. And then the mass incarceration of Black men started ever since. And uh, those people in the favelas, uh, we have this, this um, connection, this dirty connection between politicians and, and drug dealers in which they, they sell um, drugs, guns, and, and everything. And then, uh, because if you if you look, how can a poor guy from a favela get an AK-47, for example, which is a, a Russian gun, the guy doesn't even speak English. How can, he, how can he import a machine gun, for instance? There is no chance of that happening without somebody making this connection. And who is that person? So it's exactly the police, the politicians, and uh, the pretext, the idea is that they are fighting uh, the drugs. It's a war on drugs. Mm. But it's not because we have lots of white parties, for example, electronic parties, rave parties in Brazil, where mm. everybody takes drugs. Mm. And we don't, we don't see police repression. We don't see anybody being killed. We have Lollapalooza, which is a very famous uh, international mm. festival. Mm -hmm. Lots of drug consumption. People get even overdosed sometimes. And you don't see police shooting, killing anyone. Rock in Rio is another example. We have a lots of people in coma sometimes after taking lots of drugs and drinking, whatever. And there is no violence at all. So if the, the, the idea is the war on drugs, why, why don't we never see white people being killed, for example, in those parties, that are, those festivals? that they have just exemplified. So it is not a war on drugs. It's mm. a war on black people. It's, it's different, you know? So that's the, the, the actual scenario uh, in the favelas. There is a genocide of black people. Mm. Since the past, uh, they tried to whiten the population. And this is no, no secret. If you study uh, yes. Brazilian history, you will get to know that they invited immigrants from France, German, Italy to Brazil to whiten the population. We, we learned this at school. So it's no secret at all. And it's crazy. And it's crazy that it still continues. It still goes on in 2020. We mm. see this extermination of black people. Yeah, I, I read an article uh, recently which, um, which broke down. Is it... Um, embranquecimento is that is that the exactly whitening embranquecimento yeah. and it's it's staggering because you know what? I'll be honest with you a lot of the things that you're saying with regard to hey 
Hey, Apollo, greetings, greetings, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Bro. Um, someone in the comments was asking about the, the, the music in the background. I was just explaining there that I think that's that's your boy's um, um, toy that he's playing with, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. He has a piano, a Bob Marley piano. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Let him play, you know? One of, the, one of the things we need to learn to do, I think, as black people is allow our children to be in our spaces and to be comfortable in our spaces. And you know what? If sometimes we have to stop and pause and deal with the children, then we stop and pause, bring them in, let them be part of the, you know, the, the scene and not shove them off to their own kind of little room. But yeah. um, a lot of the things uh, that you're saying uh, with regard to police violence, state violence, corruption, the way that uh, black people are portrayed in, in education, the way that uh, black people are are not, or black academics are not really referred to in academia and so forth. These things sound very, very similar to me, actually, to to other parts of the African uh, diaspora. Um, so, do you do you feel like do you feel a similarity in your experience with the experience of, say, Africans? Just keep it on the continent, Africans in Colombia. We've got a brother here who's for, who's from from Colombia here. Do you feel like you guys have a similar reality or do you feel like Brazil's situation is particularly, you know, unique? No, I guess, unfortunately, our loneliness as black people is global. I have friends in many countries, even in Africa, in the diaspora, lots of countries in the diaspora because of, of English, I can communicate with people from Zambia, people who live in England, people who live in, in black people in France, and and they all say the same. It's hard to get married. It's hard to get friends. It's hard to get a job. It's hard to everything is hard. The social things is are hard uh, for black people because we don't have access. Uh, society deny that to us. So. Mm. There are some people pretend nothing ha is happening. Other people get together with other blacks and try to find this to find this scenario. We have different postures, so I don't judge people who 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 pretend nothing is going on and, and prefer to escape. And uh, I don't know, think that they are just shy. That's why they don't date. They, that's why they don't make friends. That's why they don't get a job because they are shy because they are introvert or something like that. Hmm. But I, I really preferred to get together with other black people who were feeling the same I was feeling since childhood at school. Everybody dating, everybody getting their first kiss, and I not. My goodness, what is this? What's going on? <laughs> so uh, when I got to know with my other black fellows that everybody had later experiences, like first sexual experience, first kiss, first... Hmm. First, everything. So uh, we saw that this is systemic. This is not local. This is global. And that's why I believe in Umoja. I think we really need to get together as Black people, no matter our nationality, no matter our creeds, religion, ethnic group. I think we all should stay together, share experiences, learn together, learn from each other, because this is what we have been doing since 2008 here in Pais Pretos, and I'm someone else, someone else nowadays. I, I'm much um, better as a person, as a father, as a husband, as a friend, as a brother, because of everything I share with my brothers and sisters and they share with me. So mm. what society, uh, what African uh, philosophy teach us, which life is not about uh, me, myself, and I, but what about, it's about community. This makes all the difference because um, white society, white supremacy, um, and uh, our Brazilian society teach us that we should be self-made men. We should discover, find our ways by ourselves without any help, counting on us, and that's it. And this only isolate us more and more. That's why I feel that we should uh, study our ancestry, our principles, and everything Africa has to teach us. Yes, amen, amen. Now, quilombismo, 
if that's yeah. the right pronunciation. <laughs> Shilom Bishmo. This is last, a couple of weeks ago, a brother asked uh, Afro Native World here. Uh, he he asked me to make sure that I ask you about Shilom Bishmo. Now, just to, just to um, express my ignorance, I thought Quilombo, I knew that word Quilombo, and from from my understanding of Brazilian history, I understood that, you know, things like Palmares was a Quilombo, where, where the, uh, like the, the Maroon um, or Cimarron kind of settlements where the Africans would, you know, run away from, from the enslavement and set up their own communities and, and set up these Maroon communities. That's all I, that's all I knew about um, Quilombo as a word. But then it turns out that there's a, there's a whole philosophy of um, Quilombismo, which um, exactly. I believe this guy, Abdias Donacimento, uh, Donacimento um, spoke about. So could you tell us a little bit more about uh, two things? First of all, well, together, but if you can cover Quilombismo as a philosophy and also Quilombos, uh, the existence, the continued existence of Quilombos in Brazil today and whether what we you as Brazilians or we as Africans around the world can maybe learn from how they how these kind of quilombos are, are, are structured and organized, please. Yeah, uh, some some black societies uh, after uh, the enslavement, the slavery was abolished. They they got some lands uh, which belong used to belong to them. Then the government uh, recognized that. And they uh, plant their food. They live in those places since those times until nowadays. And they are self-sufficient communities. And uh, many people uh, on vacation, they go there to get to know those groups, their foods, their histories, their traditions. And it's amazing. We have lots of quilombos in Brazil. Uh, I want to know lots of them. But uh, now that we have this pandemic scenario, we are not able to leave our homes, but I really want to do this. Mm. And Quilombismo is, is a philosophy that goes out exactly from the idea of Quilombo. So we should be self-sufficient communities uh, as Blacks, because our uh, emancipation will never come by the hands of our oppressors. So white people will never um, you know, help us to get free in our mentality, in our uh, economic conditions. So we need to be uh, self-sufficient. And the only way we can do this is by joining forces together. This togetherness is what Quilombismo is about. But then we need to follow that race first that you quoted in the beginning. So I see that this is the true challenge for, for Blacks in Brazil. We don't, we don't see themselves as a unit because we have lots of groups among Black people. We have the Black leftists, we have the Black um, feminists, we have the Black uh, Pan-Africans, we have Black people who don't believe in anything of those and don't see themselves in Af as Africans at all. And they say, we are Brazilian. We have nothing to do with Africa. Africa is a completely different culture. Mm -hmm. And we belong here. We don't belong there. So we don't want to know about Zumbi dos Palmares, Dandara, Garvey, and all those, those, those characters. They just don't care. They don't want to hear about this. And we have to respect those people as well. So it's so much different that it's. I think it's really, really hard to make all Blacks uh, join forces, join hands, and work together because we tend to focus on our differences. And this is, in my opinion, our tragedy. We don't, we cannot leave the principle of Umoja. That, that's why uh, Umoja for me is essential. It's the first principle in the celebration of Kwanzaa. And it's not by chance. That's because I think it's the, the, the the basic thing for me is the units. We should get together. Mm. There is no other way. Yeah, my um, I'm from East Africa uh, originally, and um, my uh, my my parents speak Sw Kiswahili, and I learned a little bit of Kiswahili, and uh, I'm trying to teach my children Kiswahili. And 
Moja. Well, he, he heard someone saying Umoja the other day, and he was like, oh, Moja, because he knows how to count to like five in Kiswahili. Moja, Mili, Tatu, Nne, Tano is the counting to five in Swahili. But um, yeah, Moja, Umoja. And it's kind of similar to Ubuntu as well, isn't it? What you're discussing sounds similar to the philosophy of Ubuntu. You are, yeah. I am because we are, and you know, uh, there's no I without we and, and, and so forth. Um, now, there's a term that's been brought up here a couple of times, or something that people have been asking about, uh, which is something to do with mestizo. Here we go. Mesti I don't know how you pronounce this in Brazilian. I know in Spanish it's mestizo, but in Brazilian, um, mesti. Yeah, it's like mixed race, you know. It's people who look, uh, they look brown, but they don't see themselves as blacks. They see themselves as sometimes white, sometimes something that we call mulato, even mestizo here, moreno. We have some words yeah. to describe this. And those people mostly uh, don't see themselves as blacks because they look lighter, you know? Mm. Yeah, and then a, a, a sister on Twitter uh, said this comment. She said, um, this is bipolar bimbo. <laughs> bipolar bimbo. <laughs> She said, uh, oh, I could share my screen, but I won't bother. She says, love it. It seems like they might get into topics like blanqueamiento, blanqueamiento, mestiziaje, and me, mejorar la raza. Uh, they're Spanish terms, but um, I don't know. Have you, are there similar analogous terms in Portuguese and Brazilian? With mestizia Is mestiziaje, I, pre I pre presume that's basically what you were talking about, mixed race people who feel yeah, like... Yeah, exactly, mixed, yeah. Most, there is a very famous uh, picture. I, 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 I guess you probably know that. Is the yeah. Redemption of Come, yeah. in which uh, an old lady celebrates uh, the, the baby because the baby was born white and uh, he's a, a kid of her black daughter with a, a white guy. And this is a, a, a picture of Brazilian society. Most Brazilians, they marry uh, white people, both men and women, to have lighter children. Some because they don't want their kids to suffer the same degree of racism they have suffered. Exactly, that's the picture. So some, they don't want their, their kids to suffer the same degree of racism they have suffered. And others really want their kids to look whiter. Sometimes mm -hmm. it happens as well. So this is a sad truth in our society, and many people prefer interracial relationship. And this is another chapter in Brazilian racial discussion because we you will see lots of positions about it. Some people approve because there is something that we call the solitude or the loneliness of black women, especially, and then. They would justify that those women should look for love wherever it is, even in, among the white men. And other people disagree strongly on that. So I have no opinion at all because I'm not a black woman, so I, I cannot say anything about their experiences. But I, for myself, I always knew that I would marry a black woman. This was no, there was no question about it. So uh, mm. I had this, this thing uh, decided because I know how hard it is to suffer from racism. I, and I would never want to suffer anything like that in my own home. This would be crazy. So, And we know lots of cases of children who look at their parents and say, oh, you are a monkey. Come on, shut up, and things like that. And this would be so hard to listen that I, I, can even, I can't even picture this. So I always knew that I would marry a... Uh, a, a black woman, but I, I respect people who believe in interracial relationship that believe that love has no color. Although I disagree, I respect this position as well. Mm. Now, interesting in the UK here. Let me let me give you a little bit of uh, insight into the UK here. The UK, there's not there are not many black people here in the UK. There may be two million, two million, two and a half million maximum black people in the UK out of a population of 60 million. So very, very small percentage. Uh, and because of that small percentage, or partly because of that small percentage, a large chunk of black people here in the UK do end up uh, with not black people. I believe the statistics are something like, for, for those black people who actually get married, 
obviously not all black people do get married, not all people get married, but all the black people that get married, fifth, more than 50% of the men uh, marry white women. And I think it's something like a third or 40% 40, 40 of the, the black women marry white men. So this whole issue of, of interracial relationships is very uh, heated and very tetchy and contentious here in the UK. And I think our thing here in the UK is that we risk, it's only because of immigration that keeps the black population alive, basically. Because if you cut the, if you cut the immigration tap off, then within one or two generations, yeah. black, there'll be no black people here. Every, all the black people will have had children with white women and or white men, you know, and they would turn out to be mixed. In Brazil, is there a similar fear? Would you say is there a similar fear? Because I know that embranquecimento, uh, you know, the whole policy for for a century or now, you know, has been to whiten Brazil, you know, to get bringing these white people from Europe to basically dilute the blackness to de-black Brazil. You know, I know that's that's the philosophy. Um, do you think there's a do you think there's a reasonable likelihood that that could happen? Do you think that because of the amount of uh, interracial relationships? Black Brazil might basically disappear. Yeah, there is a, a, a belief that um, interracial relationship is one of the ways of genocide of black people, mm. and this is another discussion that is really heated because people strongly disagree. I agree because I have the example in my own family. The only person is in my family who has my skin tone is my grandmother. Which means, yeah, which means if my son doesn't marry, for example, uh, a dark skinned black woman and have kids with her, mm. I will be the last one in my family with my skin tone because my grandmother is the only one with the same skin tone. All the other ones are light skinned because they have married white women and they had kids with those white women and all my cousins look white, blonde, sometimes green eyes. Okay. So what you say is, is really true. Uh, interracial uh, relationship makes uh, naturally you go whiter and whiter until the black skin vanishes completely. And there is no, this is logical. There is, <laughs> there is no uh, question about it, but I understand people who don't like this argument because they feel you know blame it's for being in an interrelation interrelation uh interracial relationship so i try not to have those discussions because it's not profitable at all apollo wants to drink some water so we'll have to take him to the kitchen that is all good yeah i will i will hold the fort while you're gone let me know when you're back yeah <laughs> okay all right have a good drink apollo <laughs> so yeah yeah, um, really good conversation we're having so far. Uh, thanks to everyone here who's who's in the comments. Um, some excellent comments that we're getting here. Um, shout out to you, Afro Native World. Afro Native World, we're working on getting some getting you guys on the on a, on a live stream as well sometime soon. So look out for that. Afro Native World, by the way, he go to, go to Afro Native World's channel actually. Uh, they've got a YouTube channel on here, and I think they might be they're um, African Colombians and they might be the only Afro Colombians I know who were doing anything on YouTube so Afro Native World just uh, just google it or search it on um, on Twitter on on YouTube um some excellent comments here that we're getting uh where are we here so let's have a look here we've got uh what we've got so Zan Zandi Zandi Radebe you said that Apartheid is well and alive in South Africa. Black lives are lost in black hands. Yeah, 2012, the Marikana, um, Marikana murders. Yeah, I remember that very, very well. I remember that very, very well. Um, my my thing when I speak to when I hear Umberto speaking, I, I kind of think these are very similar, very similar issues to what I'm hearing about in other parts of the of the diaspora, uh, actually. So. Whereas I suppose in my head, I was thinking, oh, Brazil, very unique, very, very unique country, and unlike everywhere else. Actually, these issues are just very, 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 very similar to issues that we're, that we're having in other parts of the, of the diaspora. Um, 
Yeah, that, that issue of um, interracial relationships. So Steve, Stephen, Stefan, Stephen, you said that, um, uh, yeah, people who get my, here's my opinion, and this isn't Umberto's opinion, but here's my opinion. Even if it's unconscious, it's there's still a, an unconscious or subconscious desire to get away from your race, your race, your racial identity. It might be unconscious. You might not even be thinking about it. You might not even be, um, you might not even be, uh, you know, um, if someone asked you, you might say, no, no, I don't mind. Any Anyone, anyone of every, any race I'll get with that on your conscious level. But there's, there's that whole, there's that whole, oh, Umberto's back. So I'll bring it, I'll bring it back in a minute. But there's that, there's that whole um, thing of like the, the pyramid, you only, or the, the iceberg, you only see the tip of the iceberg above the water. That's your conscious mind. But underneath the conscious mind is a whole bunch of subconscious mind, you know? Whole bunch of subconscious uh, fears, phobias, attractions, all these kinds of things, um, for ideals, philosophies about race, about ethnicity and so forth. And in that subconscious there, that's where it's saying, get away from black, go to white. That's my opinion. I, I, that's what I personally think. And it's, it's even if that's not someone's necessarily conscious, um, what do you call it, conscious, intention the result is going to be that you're going to breed out your race and some people say well race doesn't matter it's fine just breed it out it's all good but you know that let, let's just at least recognize that that's what will happen if all the black people into you know marry with other people of other races there'll be no black people left particularly if you're in a country like britain where we're such a tiny um kind of minority uh cool all right yes Umberto, sorry, I was, here we go. I was going on and on and on and on. How's Apollo, is he good? Yeah, he was really thirsty. It's pretty hot today in Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bless him. How old is he, by the way? One year and eight months. Wonderful. And he, you're, he's your only son, yeah? Your only child so far? Currently. Yeah, only child so far. <laughs> All right, I've got two, two boys. So Amazing. One, yeah, one's a year and just over a year. The other one's nearly three. So they're downstairs with mummy making noise. So uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, um, did you give them African names or? No, I gave them biblical names. Well, oh. no, he Hebrew names. They've got Hebrew names like mine. So, but, um, you know, the uh, Hebrew, African, the Hebrew is African in my opinion. The, you know, the, 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 yeah. You know, that's I've got. A, I'm gonna have a sister coming on in a few weeks to talk, who's a Hebrew Israelite, to talk a little bit about the black biblical, you know, uh, heritage and destiny. So, so yes, they've got they've got African names. <laughs> let's let's put it that way. Okay, um, nice. But, um, but yeah, uh, so what we got here? Yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, I was just saying about my um my view on the whole, you know, interracial relationships. That even if it's not conscious, ultimately you're gonna you know, you're basically breeding out your own people, your race, you know, you're, you're diluting your own race. Uh, but, you know, I don't mean that to say that everyone who is mixed race or anyone who marries into other, you know, races is bad, morally bad or anything like that. But I do think that the foundation of having a strong community is having that community exist. <laughs> and to exist, you need to, you know, you need to exist phenom you know, Phenom word, phenomenologically. Anyway, do we have to? We, yeah, we, I agree. I agree with you. And uh, Franz Fanon, he makes a great point about it in his in his books and his texts. So it's really important to have this discussion because we don't know what we what we choose subconsciously. So that's why we should read about it, discuss about it, and then we will identify why we want so bad to marry that blonde girl that we know, or that blonde guy we know, sometimes it is connected to the way we were raised. Sometimes it is connected to things we have suffered even from childhood. So I guess it's really important to have those discussions because then we can know better what's going on inside of us. And normally we don't do this. That's why I love therapy sessions, for example. Every day, every week, I learned something new about myself. It's really amazing. Okay. Wow. So you so you you attend therapy therapy sessions yourself? 
Yeah, I have weekly uh, therapy sessions. And I think in Brazil, all black people should do because we have so many uh, racial issues that it's impossible for white black people to be uh, mentally healthy uh, in Brazil. I risk say that everybody has at least some issue connected to systemic racism uh, in Brazilian society. I have no doubts uh, about it. People really, if you dig into, if you talk to a specialist, you will find out that maybe you don't try this or that career or this or that dream you have because you don't believe you might succeed. And you don't believe you might succeed because people have taught you that black people has less capacity, has less chance, less conditions to reach their goals because we have always been taught this since we were kids. So mm. it is really strong, the effect of systemic racism in all of us. Yeah. Wow, that's brilliant. And you know, it's, it's interesting because in these circles, my circles that I kind of, you know, uh, am part of, we, we don't often, or I don't often hear people talking about the practicalities of how to heal ourselves, you know, on a on a personal level, on an individual level, how to heal. Often we talk about the racism and and, and the structural things and all the problems and that. And maybe sometimes there's a there's a reluctance to actually address the symptoms, the results of those problems, which manifest themselves in our behaviors of, in various different ways that manifest ourselves in, in our behaviors. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up, that, you know, with regard to therapy. And it's, it's uh, I can tell as well from your um, Pais Pretos uh, presenters, uh, I can tell that's that's clearly a, a key part of the group as well, isn't it? To to support one another. You said that there's always someone there. There's always going to be someone there to lend a hand, to give some information, to give some advice, and so forth. Which I love. That's really powerful. So thank you, thank you for for doing that. Yeah, we need to. And uh, when we do that, something really interesting. It's not like a messiah thing, like white white people spread. When you help others, actually you are helping yourself. And this is what African philosophy teaches us. Ubuntu philosophy is about that. We are doing our uh, what we are supposed to do. It is not something that we are nice people, we are good people, or anything like that. We are just following yeah. our nature. And it's amazing to learn that because there is a Sankofa, a Dinkara, which shows a bird looking behind so it can fly higher and longer. And it's amazing because life is exactly about this. Uh, they teach us in the African teachings that time is not linear. It doesn't go only forward. It is like cyclical. You can go back to the past if you want to. And that's what we do in those conversations. Sometimes people heal themselves from wounds from their childhood by talking, by exposing what they do their pains and this is so beautiful to see how people can reborn from sharing with their brothers and sisters in a in a black community so that's why i feel really proud to be part of pais pretos presents i don't see myself as anything special there like a founder president or anything like that i'm just a member like any other and every day i can learn something with my brothers and sisters. So it's really amazing to see what comes out when we uh, propose ourselves to donate the best we have, which is our time. Time is our life. Yeah, it's our everything we have. So it's really precious to do that. And I really recommend people to belong to any kind of uh, support group or a collective or ratio discussion group um, we really see that we can learn a lot from those. It's amazing. So I, I even take this chance to ask people who are watching now or then to, if you know other groups like those, like mine, like ours, please share with me that I will be delighted to be part of this. No matter the language, English, French, Spanish, I will try to translate whatever comes out and I, I, will, I will really be glad to be part of that. Please invite me. Invite me in. I want to learn from you. I want to be with you. I want to be better with you. I really believe in Omoja. 
Wonderful stuff. And I just want to remind everybody as well uh, that uh, to get in touch with um, Pais Pretos Presentes, there's the link down at the bottom. And that will take you to this page where yeah. you can find all the different links there and join the group and so forth. It's open to everyone, regardless of where you are in the world, by the way, uh, all, all black people, regardless of where you are in the world. So um, do that. And uh, yeah, if anyone's got any other organizations that they are part of that, do, that are doing a similar thing, then uh, please do share as, as, as Umberto was saying. Now, um, I think let's use the last, are you right for the next kind of, sort of 20, 25 minutes or so to? Yeah. yeah. So we've got, got a couple of questions here, a couple of comments here. So this is from Kevin Cobham, my good good friend, good good brethren here. Um, he's talking about this, uh, this thing called the talk. So uh, this is where as a black parent, at some point you have to sit down your children and say, okay guys, you, you know, racism. Let me tell you about racism. Let me tell you about the fact. So here in the UK and, and other parts of the, the diaspora, there's the, often that includes the comment that you're going to have to work twice as hard because of the, you know, the, the, the opposition that you're going to face as a black person. It can also include things like the police, you know, you've got, you've got behaviors when you're around police or when you're out in shops and whatnot, you know, you might not be doing anything, but you have to make sure that you look even less threatening because these people look at us as being violent intrinsically and they're going to try and do a thing to you. So just, you know, keep your nose clean. Don't do anything suspicious at all and so forth. These kind of things. Do you, do you, um, do you hear about a similar kind of thing amongst the parents that you're, you're connected with in Brazil or is this something that you yourself has, have had or that you're planning on doing with your, with, with Apollo and your other children that you have? Yeah, I have I have memory of suffering racism from the first time when I was like seven uh, at school. Um, a teacher was making fun of a, a drawing I was making. In a, it was an activity, and we should we should paint uh, different jobs. And I was painting uh, a firefighter, and I decided to color the guy uh, red and, and yellow. And then the teacher said a yellow firefighter, I have never seen such a thing, and then started laughing with another woman, and I felt really embarrassed, but I didn't know it was about racism. Only later, as a teacher, 20 years of career, and, and I figured out that I had never seen a teacher laughing out of a student, so then I got to know that uh, that was me suffering racism for the first time. But in our first week in Pai Espiritus Presents, I remember, there was a father who told us that his son, who was just four years old, did not want to go to school. And then he asked why, and the kids wouldn't, wouldn't tell him. And when he insisted, the kid said he wouldn't want to go uh, to school because uh, one of his friends, a white boy, said he didn't like to sit together with black kids. And when I heard that, I really... I, I, I felt like, my goodness, what can I tell this father? I had no idea of what to say. Mm. And it was the first time I had nothing to say to somebody who asked for help among us. And then other parents, other fathers who were in the group started sharing experiences and, and giving uh, advice to that father. But I remember it was really strong for me, really heavy to get to know that at the age of four, I might have to discuss this issue with my son. It was really, it was, wow, a punch. <laughs> I, I felt like a punch in the face. I felt really, really knocked out. It was really hard for me. Mm. Yeah. So maybe four, four, year old, four years old might be, when you may need to start having those discussions, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, my son's three, coming up to three, so, you know, not long now. I wanted to ask you, actually, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, do you have in Brazil black areas or, 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 or you know, boroughs or, or, or quarters of towns which are predominantly populated by African people, African-descended people? Because I ask, because here in the UK, we 
we don't really have many of those. We have we have we have some, but unfortunately, because of the effects of the historic effects of of, of racism, white supremacy, those areas that are predominantly black tend to be quite have a lot of social problems, crime, you know, violence, low, low. They're they're very very working class. People might call them lump and proletariat kind of areas, which are which are hard hard places to live, you know. Um, but but yeah, that, so that made me kind of think. I know in America they have you know predominantly black towns or parts of predominantly uh, predominantly black parts of towns. But what's it like in Brazil in that regards? Yeah, in Brazil we have more cultural uh, ghettos. I would say maybe ghetto because the word ghetto is usually connected to resistance. So if we think like that, we have places like in Rio de Janeiro, for example, we have a place called Madureira, which is where you have a lot of black culture being celebrated. We have capoeira, we have uh, jongo, we have uh, hip hop. So it's a, a, a strong place here, uh, racially sp speaking, but not that people live there. We have most blacks living there, but usually it's more uh, well known for the, the culture, the black culture uh, presence there. Even in the favelas nowadays, we have many uh, white people as well because of poverty. People don't yeah. don't have where to live, so they move to those areas. Yeah, wonderful, um, brilliant. Okay, um, now a brother here has asked us to talk about uh, talk about Abdias Nascimento. Uh, so, who was this guy? Why why is he an important figure in the in the African world? Yeah, he, he's important because he's important not only uh, in the racial activism, but also in the arts. He was a, a, a pioneer in the experimental theater, as we call uh, in Brazil, which was a very uh, important movement in which he launched lots of black actors and artists also. And uh, as a writer uh, as well, uh, he wrote many books about the racial scenario in Brazil, and especially because uh, when you talk about quilombismo, it is a kind of version, a Brazilian version of Garvey, because he always talked about self-sustainable uh, uh, self -sustainable communities, self-sufficiency of black societies, and I think this is uh, crucial. If we want to really uh, emancipate ourselves, we need to be how we need to know how to be uh, self-sustainable. There is no other way because all all the black groups which uh, depend on white help, white economy, or white money, uh, consequently are uh, very limited in their capacity of developing knowledge uh, and even deciding on where to go as a group, because they, there is someone else deciding uh, the access they have. So it's really necessary, it's urgent, I would say, to be self-sustainable. Yeah, wonderful. And then one of the questions, we, we'll, we'll wrap up in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but that was, I had, a, I had a bunch of questions I was gonna ask you. And what usually happens in these conversations is that I managed to get to like maybe 20% of the questions, because, you know, <laughs> and it's good, it's beautiful. You can't plan these things I've, I've learned. But um, I was going to ask you a, a little, if you can maybe tell us a little bit about the the history of, of black resistance in in Brazil and maybe some of the, some of the organizations and other notable figures who perhaps have helped to fly the flag for for, for Afro-Brazilians Afro uh, over the last uh, period of time? Yeah, I think, I think that if, since slavery, we have lots of important uh, figures. We have uh, uh, Dandara, which is um, very famous from uh, the Quilombo, uh, the Spalmaris. We have uh, many, many, many um, um, fighters for the ends of slavery coming to recent times, like uh, Luis Gama, for example. This guy was very, very important uh, to uh, set free uh, black slaves uh, in Brazil. And after slavery, we have the first uh, 
engineers, the first doctors who were black, those people, in my opinion, was they were really important because they were inspiration for the others to look, to aim higher, to aim to have positions in, in society as well. So uh, we have Rebouças, for example, which was a very uh, important guy. He was an engineer uh, in Brazil, a black uh, engineer. And uh, I believe that also, if we look into, uh, into the theory, we have lots of important people as well. We were talking about Abdus Nascimento, that in my opinion is, is uh, essential. We have uh, other uh, uh, theorists, both men, male and, 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 and female, discussing these issues as well. But I, I believe that uh, when we talk about the, those uh, big names, we have one, one risk of uh, making regular people know that they cannot get there, that they are just few and those big names are, are the ones, the guys. And I really believe in this, uh, in, in the work people can do together. I really believe in togetherness. So mm -hmm. people who study Abdias Nascimento, people who study um, Luis Gama, people who study all those black figures from the past, like Zumbidos Palmares, for example, if they join forces and study what those people were about, they can do the same or even more nowadays. I think it's important to, to highlight this because many people, they, they worship those figures from the past and nowadays they do nothing because they don't believe they can do. They believe only the, the, the past heroes Mm. had their chance and now there is nothing which can be done. So I really think it is uh, important to encourage those people to uh, not only study our heroes, but try to do the same they did in the past. Amen, amen, amen. Ashe, ashe. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. There definitely is a... A sort of hero, almost like a. There's a. I was, I've been wanting to do a video about this at some point, like about leaderism. There's like a this thing about oh, we need a great leader. We need a we need another brother Moses to lead us across the Red Sea, as as Bob Marley sang in the song Exodus. And it's that thing of you know my my thing on that is that look, if you're so focused on leaders, great individuals who are going to like you know who are going to lead us through and and make it all better for us again. Obviously, all that the enemies need to do is to just get rid of that leader. And that's what they did in the 1960s in America, in particular 60s, 70s and 80s. They just kept killing them off. So there's a film coming out this year about Fred Hampton called The uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's about Fred Hampton, who was one of the Black Panther leaders. And, you know, they just killed him. Young man. And he's uh, maybe maybe not even 20. I, can't, I don't know how old he was. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Malcolm X. Uh, Martin Luther King, or they either they killed them, or they they um, they did what they did to to, to Mosiah Garvey, which is basically you know um, destroyed his reputation and basically you know physically removed him from the USA and, and deported him. It is um, true. But if you if you have uh, if your structure of your organizations is focused on more of a web a spider's web type you know, um, structure whereby rather than, no, here's the leaders and we're going to tell you what to do and then you go off and do it. If you have a web structure where actually we're operating more like cells and we're doing it for ourselves and then we're teaching each other and we're teaching each other and so forth, then you're, you know, you're impregnable, you know, you're, you're, you're never going to be, you're never going to be able to be um, destroyed by those kinds of, um, exactly, those kinds of um, strategies, you know. Let me get a bottle here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Can you ask my crazy friends would be allowed to do this? What? What's this? Jarena, what's this? Jarena Starr asks, can you ask why a crazy white feminist would be allowed to do this, putting white women's body parts on the soil? What's that? <laughs> I'm not sure what uh, what Jarena's talking about there, but it's... it's uh, Sounds sounds crazy. <laughs> sounds crazy. Um, 
yeah I'm, I'm not sure about that but there you go all right well you know what apollo's there bless bless him very very well behaved i must i said it to you before i must say it again he's playing on his own there just happily getting on with it that's a well you know well behaved and, and resourceful young boy there you've only had to get up like what twice or something to get him and give him some drinks that's all good so you're right little mtoto right Hi. yeah <laughs> that's really good but yeah i know you um I know you need to get off, uh, and I need to get off as well down to go and help with my wife downstairs, who's holding it down with the boys. So um, I've really enjoyed this. This um... oh, was there anything else that you wanted to add actually before I just shut it all off? Anything else you want to say for now um, before I before I do a little outro and? Yeah, I just want to say that we are all a family, and we should join forces and work together. I don't believe in running apart. I don't believe in, in uh, each one doing uh, a separate work isolatedly. So I really believe in working together. I believe in togetherness. When I say umboja, when I say race first, it is not just about words. I really mean that. So please do believe me and uh, find me and contact me because I, I really believe in joining forces. That's how we got where we are nowadays. Uh, we were just a, a group of, a bunch of guys on, on WhatsApp, 12 guys on WhatsApp. And nowadays we have like uh, 42,000 followers on Instagram. We have 22,000 members on our Facebook group. We have 30,000 people following our Facebook page. We have almost 1,000 people subscribed to our YouTube channel. And this is done. Because of people work together. Yeah, yeah. this is togetherness. Uh, it really comes to a result. Last year, uh, we spoke to more than 20 companies, famous companies. I spoke about Black uh, Fatherhood to Johnson Johnson, Cognizant, uh, Telefonica Vivo, which is a, a mobile phone company. So. It was a very uh, big year for us. Of course, most of it was because of George Floyd's and anti-racism uh, campaign that went global. And mm -hmm. I don't know if they, they are going to look, uh, they are going to keep uh, working to fight racism or if it was just a trend uh, caused by George Floyd, something temporary. Mm -hmm. This year will teach us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. To cut you. There was one question I meant to put to you actually before before you go. Uh, this is from Afro Native World, our Afro Colombian brother. He said, uh, "Do you plan on reforming Brazil or moving to Africa to live in Africa?" What's your yeah? I, I, I am I am already reforming Brazil because I'm a teacher uh, in public schools, and we have a law here, ten six nine zero. Dash O three, which is a law aimed at um, teaching uh, black history and black culture at schools, but nobody respects this law. Mm. So I think we have to fight for this. I think this is an essential cause, and uh, we cannot give up because if we give up, white teachers will keep saying that uh, white kids are descendants of slavers, which is hard, so hard to, to hear. We will keep not listening at schools about anything from Africa, from our heritage, our heroes, our black heroes who contributed significantly to our society. So I really think we cannot throw the towel because if we do so, the next black generations will pay the price. And I cannot do this because I have a son, I have a baby son, and I know the consequences of throwing the towel. So throwing the towel, in my opinion, is white privilege. Black people cannot do this. <laughs> I love that. That is a that is a great way, that is a great place to, to, to close on that. So Umberto, it's been a real absolute pleasure. And yeah, let's let's work together, man. Let's let's see what we can do, how we can connect, you know, how I can connect with you, how I, how I can connect with um Pais Bretos Presentes. And uh, let me again just share the group here on the screen. Everyone, please do please do link up with uh, with with them on their on their links here, on their pages here. So just go to the link that's 
scrolling at the bottom of the page there that'll take you to this um this my urls links that's got all the various different things youtube facebook instagram whatsapp and also a link to actually join um join the organization so that's wonderful stuff. So I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you go now, my brother. So thank you very much, Humberto, and hopefully we'll um, we'll have you on the Africans Arise uh, live as as again at some point in the future, if that will be oh, all right. Great, it will be a pleasure. Thank you so much, my brother. Hotep. 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 Peace. 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 Shalom. Peace. Shalom. All right. <laughs> bye bye. Uh, all right. Well, that's been a great conversation, wasn't that great? That was a, that was a really really good conversation guys um where that was him umberto Balta, um, who's the creator and uh key participant of um, pais pretos presentes which is an organization in brazil um i hope you've enjoyed the conversation i want to just uh, encourage you again to make sure that you uh hook up with me on the on the various different links here as well so i've got my instagram my instagram page my twitter page my facebook uh you can email me as well at africans the rise at hotmail.co.uk and in particular i'm particularly keen to you know if you guys know of anyone else in other parts of the world the african world who who might be up for coming onto the onto the channel then then do let, let, let me know you know because it's it's great it's great to be connecting with our brothers and sisters in 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 on the western hemisphere and you know in the americas but something i thought about today was that i would like to be connecting with our, our black brothers and sisters in the Indian subcontinent, because there's a lot of those there as well, you know? Australia, Papua, Papua, you know, Papua New Guinea, um, the, the Melanesian islands and so forth, you know? So hook me up if you if you know of any brothers and sisters uh, who, who would be cool to come on. So yeah, thank you guys, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for all of the comments, all of the guys who've been um, in the comments there. The comments will be on the replay, so make sure that you that you check those out when the, when the video is up again on catch up so i'm gonna say on that note peace audi everybody have a blessed rest of the evening if you're in my time zone have a blessed rest of the afternoon morning day and so forth depending on what time zone you guys are in and you know time is just a time is a, is a construct so you know just have a great time wherever you are make sure you subscribe make sure you like the video as well and guys i'll, I'll see you soon catch you soon all right peace